In this novel 360 degree video tutorial, we would like to demonstrate our technique on mitral valve repair through a right anterolateral mini thoracotomy approach. Anesthesia is provided as per the institution's standard protocols. Single lumen intubation is routinely used, although double lumen intubation can be used for single lung ventilation in complex cases requiring difficult dissections. Transesophageal echocardiography is routinely used with particular focus to aid correct cannula placement and provide both anatomical and functional views of the mitral valve. Two defibrillator pads are placed across the chest wall. The patient is positioned supine with the right chest elevated by a small pillow beneath the right scapula, and the right arm is placed on a sideboard to maximize the space for placement of the surgical ports. Two multifunctional long arms are positioned on each side of the patient. They will be used to hold the endoscopic camera and atriotomy retractor, respectively. The right femoral vessels are cannulated. Access to the vessels is obtained through a 3 to 4 cm incision just inferior to the inguinal ligament, at the point where they tend to run parallel to each other. Proline sutured purse strings are placed wide enough to leave a cap of vascular tissue after the cannulas are inserted. The cannulas are introduced using a guide wire, starting with the vein and then the artery. Echocardiography is crucial for correct placement and to avoid misadventure with the venous cannula or aortic dissection with the arterial cannula. Good venous drainage is usually obtained with a multi-stage vacuum-assisted femoral venous cannula. We use the Biomedicus Metronics size 21 or 25, with the tip sitting a few centimeters into the superior vena cava. For the femoral artery, we use a straight, flexible arterial cannula, such as the Edwards Opticite, size 18 or 20, there is no need to snare down the purse strings as the dilated axis is adequately hemostatic. The cannulas are connected to the cardiopulmonary bypass machine and the patient is put on bypass. A four to six right submammary incision is made to enter the third or fourth intercostal space. A preoperative chest X-ray helps delineate the height of the diaphragm and assess the correct intercostal space. In females, following the submammary incision, the space can be easily found by migrating up to the axis the correct intercostal space. An endoscopic zero-degree camera is placed through a 10 mm port, one space above the mini thoracotomy. Carbon dioxide is connected to this port to insufflate the pleural cavity to minimize the risk of air embolism. 
the mini thoracotomy is accessed using an Ale Alexis soft tissue wound retractor and a small rib retractor such as the Gister mini thoracotomy retractor. This rib retractor is placed on top of a malleable plate to retract the diaphragm. This plate will later be used to retract the inferior posterior wall of the left atrium. Pericardial fat can be excised to give better visual access of the field. For the pericardiotomy, it is good to leave a calf of tissue anteriorly, so the pericardiotomy is a third of the way back from the front of the pericardium. This leaves enough tissue for closing the pericardium again afterwards and also gives enough access whilst still giving a good shelf of pericardium which can be retracted laterally, thereby holding the right lung back and giving a good working surface to access the left atrium for the atriotomy. Three suture retractors are placed to expose the left atrium. Two sutures are placed in the posterior pericardial tissue, and the third suture is placed in the interatrial groove. This third retracting suture is exteriorized through a five millimeters anterior chest port just lateral to the border of the sternum. This port is carefully created so as not to injure the internal thoracic vessels. Cannulating the ascending aorta for cardioplegia and for the airing is a high risk component of this operation. Although it is similar to an open procedure, endoscopic instruments are used with care taken to be as neat as possible in the first go. After many years of experience, Dr. Edwards prefers to put two pledgeted purse string sutures with the second purse string as a safety measure so that when the root cannula is removed, there is a second purse available to deal with any small leaks without having to suture the aorta towards the end of the procedure. Using one of these sutures, a root cannula is inserted with one arm connected to the cardioplegia line and the other arm to the vent line. Once this line is prime, a detachable aortic clamp is placed into the ascending aorta. We use the Glauber clamp. A dose of anti-grade cardioplegia is delivered into the aortic root. Cardioplegia and cardiopulmonary bypass settings can be tailored to the institution's preference. The left atriotomy is performed similarly to an open procedure. The previously placed interatrial groove suture aids correct incision. At this point, there are two key maneuvers to maximize atrium access. The first maneuver is by placing a detachable atrial lift retractor and securing it through the same port side used for the interatrial suture retractor. And the second maneuver is to reposition the previously placed plate over the diaphragm into the inferior posterior wall of the left atrium. Adequate venting is achieved by continuous action through the aortic root and by placing a malleable cannula in one of the pulmonary veins. Following these routine steps, the valve is easily assessed due to the good direct visualization of the entire valve which is at times difficult to visualize through an open sternotomy. In this video, we demonstrate two cases. In the first case, 
we can see a redundant posterior leaflet with prolapse of P1 and P2, and a competent P3 and anterior leaflets. Dr. Edwards decided to repair this valve by trimming the prolapse P1 corda and resecting a wedge of P2. The gap is then repaired with a continuous proline suture. In the second case, there is a prolapsing P2 from cordae rupture. Dr. Edwards decided to implant neocordae, which he prefers to fabricate. In this way, the neocordae length and the number of loops can be tailored to each particular case. The distance from the papillary muscle to the edge of the leaflet is measured using a ruler. Dr. Edwards used the valve gate moor suture ruler which also facilitates the creation of the loops with Gorotex suture. The arms of this suture are used to implant the loops into the papillary muscle, which can be difficult and needs good exposure and practice. Each loop is then sutured to the free border of the prolapsing leaflet. In both cases, the repair is completed by placing a semi-rigid complete mitral ring using interrupted sutures which are knotted with an endoscopic knot pusher. water pressure test shows good competence of the repair valve. The atriotomy is closed with a proline suture starting from either end and not in halfway.
ventricular pacing wires are positioned before removing the cross clamp as this is easier to do before the heart starts beating again. They are easily exteriorized through the parasternal port. The cross clamp is removed after the aiding maneuvers, but the aortic root bend is kept in for as long as possible to complete the airing, similarly to an open procedure. Following reperfusion of the heart, an echocardiographic assessment of the valve for competence and satisfactory the airing, the root cannula is carefully removed. Here, having two pairs of strings prevents the need for suturing the aorta. The pericardium is then approximated with interrupted sutures to facilitate future redo procedures. A drain is placed one or two intercostal spaces below the mini thoracotomy, which is then closed using pericostal sutures. Femoral decanulation should only be done once the patient is stable as trying to recannulate the vessels may be difficult and carry potential complications. The purse strings are then knotted and sometimes an extra hemostatic suture is placed. The groin and the mini thoracotomy wounds are then closed in layers. <laughs>